So this is our kitchen. And every morning, me and my wife, we have, we have coffee together. And so uh, every day I get to see my guys. They're not able to be here, but I'm able to reflect and be thankful that I am here. And I'm able to be here today because of them. So we get to start our day off every day with some coffee and thanks. Clark with a shotgun. And Darrell's just a straight run here. And he's got the corner. And more. 35 20. Up to the 24 yard at the five. Derek Williams in motion. Plenty of time in the corner. And Alex Allen, the offensive captain. It's uh, really a honor to be respected by our teammates as captains. Uh, just in my room, just to lead by example, both of the at times, and just have you know, great thing going on. Ah, what's up, everybody? What is going on out there? It's your boy, Daryl Clark, also known as the captain. And it's your boy, A-Train, Alex Allen. And I want to welcome you to the fourth episode of The Backfield. Now, of course, you know The Backfield is a place where we come to give you the real spiel. We're here to inspire, motivate, and also inform. But before we get started, listeners, viewers, don't forget to stop, like, share, and subscribe. Subscribe. To the backfield podcast. Shout to the producer, producer, my little brother Darnell. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Always great to see you. Always great to see you. Keep doing you what you do. Love you, man. Yes, sir. We yeah. definitely appreciate you, Darnell. Yes, Make sure y'all don't forget to also follow the Instagram, mm -hmm. the uh, TikTok, mm -hmm. and like I said, obviously the YouTube because that's what we're on. Absolutely. But today we have a special edition. Super special. Usually we got the home game. We in our home space. We you know we cool. But we traveled a little bit today. We're in somebody else's house. So we come in with respect. But at the same time, I think this is going to be great. Um, the guy that we're going to interview is, is family to me. I've known him for the last five years. We've grown to you know know each other, respect each other tremendously. And let me get, just give you guys just a slight introduction, okay? Talk to so the guy is Gunnery Sergeant, retired Gunnery Sergeant, Sean Delgado. It says, Gunnery Sergeant Sean Delgado served in the Marine Corps for 20 years. 20 years. He was a Marine recruiter in Denver, Colorado. He served in the first Gulf War in 1991, Somalia in 1993, Afghanistan in 2001, just to name a few. He received two Purple Hearts, something earned, the Bronze Star, and various other awards. He joined Lima Company, which we will get into, in October of 2004 active duty Marine to help train the reservists. He served as the weapons platoon leader and his squad's nickname was Delgado's Death, Death Squad. Squad. Delgado, my guy. Appreciate you allowing us to be here. Thank you for having me. Sir, so, appreciate it. So, so one second, one second, sorry. I didn't, mean, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. I just wanted to tell you before we get started, I've heard so much about you read so much about you, watched so much about you, and for to finally get a chance to meet you in your presence, I just want to say thank you for your for your sacrifice, for your dedication. Absolutely. And everything that you've done for all of us here as well as the, the country. I really appreciate it. It is an honor and a privilege to be in your presence. I appreciate that. Thank sure. you very much. Sure. I ain't going to say all that. You, nah, you, you already I know how I feel about you. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man, I love him like a brother. Uh, but, yeah, this, this Death Squad, I, that's the dopest name. I didn't heard of something. You know what I'm saying? We 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 sit down in DC and now we try to think about names, but to have a nickname Delgado's Death Squad. Tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Well, in in uh, Iraq, when when Lima Company went, um, we were tasked with doing a lot of missions, and my platoon specifically, um, we were mounted in in vehicles, and. Um, you know, we had an understanding that even though we were in Iraq, 
the space between me and my brother, the space between my vehicle and your vehicle, even though we're in Iraq, is America. That's American soil. Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, if you come in that, you get what you get. And so um, just like you guys have branding, the backfield, yeah. right? Yes, sir. We actually painted skulls and crossbones on our vehicles, on the hood, on the side. And when we came in, we meant business. Yeah. And, and if you shot at us, we were going to prosecute those targets. And the uh, Iraqis are the, actually the ones who named us. Wow. So So that wasn't wow. a self-proclaimed -pro from... No. Wow. Okay. Yeah, Iraqis. Name. Wow. Well, there, there it is. Yeah. Delgado's death squad. <laughs> In a nutshell. In a nutshell. Sean, we're, we're, so obviously, uh, I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. You don't know, you know, DC, I talk a lot about him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's from Youngstown as well. You know, we both grew up the same way. Um, violence, drugs, you know, poverty. Uh, but sports got us out, you know what I mean? And that's one of the reasons why we're able to talk about the backfield and what it means to us. It is not just sports, you know, it's a lifestyle. As we spoke about it time and time again, um, a running back can be in a quarterback. We sit in, uh, behind the line of scrimmage and we're able to analyze the defense. And in life, the defense for us is what's going out there, what's going on out there in the world, you know, so we can go out there and execute, you know. <clears throat> so um, where'd you grow up and were, were spark, sports a part of your life? Absolutely. I grew up in Texas. Okay. So um, in Houston, the area around Houston. H town. You know, so um, I grew up what you would call an impoverished lifestyle today. That's, what, that's the, the new term. Okay. You know, uh, underrepresented, if you will. All but, right. um, you know, um, we grew up hungry. We grew up desperate. But sports was where we could all come together and accomplish something together. So, yes, I did grow up in sports. And um, I'm a terrible baseball player. <laughs> all you right. know, I'll tell you flat out. Um, but my, my, my game was football. Um, okay. Oh my, my game was football. football. That's his game. Hold on, let him. My game was football. Call. I'm gonna let him get it. I'm let gonna let him go. Right? Um, but but just like I grew up underrepresented, I was an offensive lineman, uh, and so right, man. still, no respect, no respect. still my under, man. still so underrepresented, right? 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 Yeah, sure. Nobody talks about you, yeah. you know. But you know, you still got to get it done. What position on the line? I was a center. So I oh, just, yeah. Boy. Yeah. Oh, that's your boy. Wham! Let me be center Let me exchange. Wham. You know what time it is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I was a center. And, um, you know, um, but talking the same thing, you still have to read that defense. That's Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. You got to call it in. And, um, and, and I enjoy inspiring. I enjoy educating. And I, I, I respect you guys for what you do and how you do it. No doubt. No doubt. Well, we respect you tremendously. We Absolutely. We wouldn't be sitting here with you. So how I come to know Sean... Uh, we were, you know, working with the same company, uh, when we first met each other, walked into a room and I see him and he see me and it's just, it's a mutual respect thing. It was just more like a, you know, you know I'm more like this, you know, I'm black. I put my head up. You're what? I'm black. Oh, black. you oh. know that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, black people, we put their head up trying to look at me and gave me what it is, you know? <laughs> But uh, oh. but no, it was it, you know it wasn't a conversation. It was just like, hey, that's a dude. This is this is his, his words. How he says, it. "You're a dude." I'm like, I hey, I respect him. And then uh, over the time, you know, the respect grew. Uh, he ended up being the president. I ended up being his vice president, and uh, the bond was created. You know, I would go to him for uh, advice. You know, not knowing his whole history about the military, knowing that he served in the military, but not knowing everything that I know now. But a uh, solid dude, very humble, and that's how I come to know. Uh, Sean, and I thank God for it, for sure. Definitely thank God for it. Well, hold on for a that's second. his story. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. That's yeah. his story. One second. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> oh, what we got? This, What's up? This gets it likewise. Oh, no, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, oh, you <laughs> met it too, just today. Today. Oh, likewise. Man, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to find him. All right. All right. I'm glad I to find him. <laughs> we, we share a lot of uh, similarities, not for just sure. the football. I'm playing the center. I'm playing quarterback. Spoke before we turned these cameras on, and being from Houston, being a Houston fan, sure, Houston Oilers. I told him my favorite quarterback was Warren Moon. He told me his favorite quarterback was Warren Moon. Come on, man. Oh, okay. Come on, man. I, I just like I've known him my whole life. Yeah, when I hear likewise, it's more like yeah, that's the same story I had. But I get you though. You tomato, know. tomato, tomato. But uh, I, I, not to contradict you. Uh huh. It was me who did that. 
<laughs> with the, <laughs> with the head. What, what did I do? You were like, you did the. Hey, that's what I said. And I did the. Uh, so, so, so you was more sizing me up. Yeah. You were sizing I'm, me I'm up. Checking you out. Yeah. yeah. Respect. Every, every room you go to, you got to. You got to. Okay. Okay. What's What's that about, though? Huh? What's that about? The, the sizing up. Well, I mean, I think um, the truth of the matter is, is, is uh, when you're an alpha mm-hmm. and you walk into a room, you want to see who else is alpha. And, um, you know, it, it, it's not a threat thing. Right, right. It's uh, who can I count on thing. Right. Sure. Did you, you know? did, are you saying you recognize me as an alpha or you weren't sure? No, I recognize you as an alpha. Respect. Yeah, I, absolutely. And and the way that you carried yourself, the way that okay. the way that you like were walking into a room, you had provenance to you. Mm-hmm. And so you know what, I can give that for sure. You know, um, and I'm I'm humble enough to know that uh, you know I'm not the only alpha in this room. Although I'm the alpha, but I'm not the only alpha in the room. You know. Um, I can give that, especially for a young dude. Yeah. You know, I got to give you something. For sure. The uh, This is your house, so we, you, can, you can have it. I, I, <laughs> I love this. You can I have love it. it. I love it. I love what it. What about my, my guy when you when you met him? Did you recognize the same thing? I, I thought he was really pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, that's a quarterback for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Pretty much, uh, honest, you know, uh, you got to be pretty at, 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 the, at the glamorous position. You know how it goes. But the, he gets all the interviews. He gets all the interviews. Yeah. But but today this is about you. It's all about you, brother. So the, the center. Now you're gonna get your glory, and you're able to give the glory to those who de- deserve it. You know. But I'm married now, so no glory comes to me. <laughs> <laughs> so we we thank your beautiful wife for allowing us to do this too. Absolutely. Um, back to the sports thing, real quick. Yeah. You did sports, played center. Did it keep you out of trouble? Keep it real now. No. No, I mean, it It did, but it didn't. I mean, during football season, yes. Okay. Um, but, I mean, the truth is, I was wild. Okay. And uh, my my brothers were wild. My cousins are wild. And, and y'all all played together, or you mean and just outside of football? Outside of football. Okay. So, you know, at, at school... Our coaches have a heavy hand, so yes, at school you you can't be getting in any trouble. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, once you get away from school, it's those outside influences, and um, you know. So uh, now my mom tried to keep us out of trouble. Mm-hmm. You know, the moms. Yeah, my mom tried to keep us out of trouble, and all the other moms that she empowered from the neighborhood. Yeah, tried to keep us out of trouble. Takes a village. Takes a village. Right? Oh, I got my butt whooped by villages all the time. So. <laughs> but, um, you know, they tried. Mm-hmm. Um, but you got to grow through those things. And, you know, desperation, desperation and hunger and anger, you know, it, it drives people and kids to do things that, that, you know, any other time they probably wouldn't do. Right. Sure. I, I, I get it. Yeah, anytime I act up, you know, mom cracked that whip on me, took that belt out and tore me up as soon as I acted up. And I mean, you're talking about pops. Now, my mom was good at throwing shoes. Oh, oh she hit you with the shoe? Oh, she hit you with the shoe. She had like a boomerang shoe. She hit you going and coming. So. <laughs> going and coming. Yeah, out. yeah you got nothing. <laughs> you don't even have a chance. <laughs> you ain't got a chance. I, I definitely so you got would, nothing. I definitely would rather get a. Punished by my father and mother. Oh. Because when she when she did it, it was, hey, touch your toes and don't move. Oh. Yeah. That's how moms used to do it. That's not OnlyFans. <laughs> Mr. Delgado. What? <laughs> my man. <laughs> my man. <laughs> you got to love it, Yo. man. I love it. This is why we do what we do. My this man. is awesome. <laughs> this Bro. <laughs> hey, all right. Um, so you're a Houston fan. What do you think about OSU product, CJ Stroud? Mm. Mm. Offensive rookie of the year. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
well, I mean, how can you argue? The production is there. The numbers are there. I thought he should have been talked about in the MVP. You know? That I mean, um, what other team finished where they finished without CJ? The only thing they really added was CJ. And D'Amico. And D'Amico. Right. Right. But without CJ, who's throwing to D'Amico? Got a point there. You know, so. Got a point there. Um, you know, and, and to take nothing away from Baltimore. Yeah. They were a winning team with or without Lamar. Lamar. Okay. Sure. And so um, I thought he should have been talked about more. Yeah. And as an MVP candidate. And everybody just settled on, you know, offensive rookie MVP and mm -hmm. all that. But his numbers stack up with anybody else's numbers. And, and I know you got something to say about it, but Tank Dell was a receiver I think you were talking about. You said who's going to throw it to the D'Amico. D'Amico Ryans was the uh, head, head coach. coach. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. right. Yeah. 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 D'Amico is coach. Well, no. yeah. Yeah. And he should have been coach of the year. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. That's what I'm about to say, too. You know, definitely should have been coach of the year. Yeah. Stefanski, you got to stop moving. Yeah. I'm trying. Um, I'm, just, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, he should have been coach of the year. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, but, but. Again, um, and again, not taking nothing away from Kevin Stefanski because the job he did with Cleveland was a good job. But, you know, I, I know, I know. Um, Diller. Yeah. But but um, that's because he's a hater. You know, you know. And you Talk come about by, it. He comes by natural. He's a Steeler fan. Right? <laughs> but, but, you know, I think D'Amico Ryan, honestly, um, with a rookie – quarterback new offense new players new systems mm -hmm. new management i mean everything was new and they look what they did I, I they should have been mvp he should have been coach of the year in my opinion that's a good, great opinion i know you'll touch on it but they also yeah. had the uh, defensive rookie of the year as well so that should even help his case for him to right. be coach of the year but go ahead i know you oh, no, i was just gonna agree with what he was saying about cj I, I was sold on CJ because I watched him play quite a few times here at Ohio State. And I watched him live. I went to a few of his practices. And I just watched how he was able to make all the throws, see the field. He had a great understanding in whatever it was that, <clears throat> excuse me, whatever it was that he was pl placed in front of. And then, you know, uh, struggled a little bit against Michigan. And then they got another chance to uh, play in the playoffs, college playoffs, play lights out against Georgia. Now, I know we're talking a, a, a year ago or whatnot, but give or take a, full, a field goal, they're playing in the national title game instead of Georgia. And then that momentum that he carried from playing against Georgia carried right into his rookie year. Absolutely. Playing with the Houston Texans. You're, he didn't lose a beat. You're missing something. Come on. Yeah. Because I don't like the way they do the combine. Okay. Because they talk bad about him at the combine. What? They I, did him dirty. They, yeah. They did him dirty at the combine. They talked about his – intelligence, lack of intelligence, inability to read defenses, mm -hmm. this new mental test that they have going out. They'll got him you know? his attention. So they, you know, they, they did him dirty. They did. They did. And, and um, I think it was some of those collusion from some of those other football teams um, that are regretting it now. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, um, yeah. because they, they, they talk bad about him without even looking about how he performed. Mm -hmm. They got away from the film. Right. Yep. You know, they talk about a man's hands. They talk oh, about, yeah, yeah, all that. You know, they talk yeah. about his, it used to be, what is it, the wonder lick? It the wonder lick test. Now it's this other set. So, try and find faults yeah, for no reason. They yeah. try to find all these faults <clears throat> in him. And instead of judging him for what he did on the field, who he did it with, and, and how he elevated those pe those other players' games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the thing that CJ didn't do at Ohio State, which was new, was he wasn't a, really a running quarterback. He was right, didn't run. Right. You know, so um, really, uh, him as an NFL style quarterback should have had more more looks. Yeah, he ended up at the right spot. Though. The right everything spot. Happens for was, everything. Well, happens for he did end short. up at at the right spot with the right coach mm -hmm. and the right offensive coordinator. But um, teams are. It's gonna cost him money, man. It, it costed him money. 
It, I mean, if we're being real, it yeah, costed yeah. him money. Absolutely. You know, and they did it purposely. I don't like collusion. Well, yeah, I get you. But given the situation, okay, I was just, given the situation that he was placed in, and all the fault that everyone was talking and giving to him, I felt like he responded in the most best, absolute way possible by going yeah. out and letting his game talk. He did that. Conclusion. You said they did it in conclusion. Collusion. 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 What, yeah. what do you mean by that? Like, just keep it. Back. So the NFL owners, the NFL owners, um, and the general managers, um, they come together. And they collude with each other to say, mm, we like this guy, but we don't like this guy. We like his game, but we don't like that game. We like that coach, but we don't like that coach. We like that school, but we don't like that school. We, okay. like, we, like, that, okay. we like that particular uh, Big Ten. Well, really, it's not the Big Ten. It's the SEC that everybody likes, but... You yeah, know, yeah. we like this SEC, but we don't like the Big Ten. So automatically, they just discount. Mm -hmm. I see. I, yeah. That that this that this young man who accomplished so much in a, f a small amount of time. They they classified him as a system mm -hmm. quarterback. Come on, <laughs> we was going to say that, man. Game manager. The future's bright for CJ. It is. It is. Very bright. Very bright. Um, as long as he can control this. Dude, it, I, I think he'll, he'll be, be fine. fine. Yeah. yeah he'll he's, be he's grounded. Oh, he's you know what? He's a young first, man with a, a lot young, with a lot of open to him. A lot of open to him. But you know what he does? Who does he put first? Every interview. God. Put God first. Yeah, I got you. First. So um, unless something comes along and just changes that, I think he'll be fine. I think you're right. Um, do they still do the Wonder Lick? No. No. Oh, that's something else. It's that new... Um, is it S two? I don't know. <laughs> it's a it's a new it's a new test that they actually said is supposed to be more accurate than the Wonderlic, but even now, um, there's a lot of agents who are telling their players, "Do not even take that not test." Take it. You took the Wonderlic. Mm -hmm. How was? What do you think about it? Common sense, mm -hmm. multiple choice. I mean, you know, they after I passed it, they told me I should have been in honor classes. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I did real well. Did real well. I mean, but you know, what's the high score? Um, mine. <laughs> I don't necessarily. You talking, dude? You talking? Ooh, you talking back? Twenty ten. I'm not necessarily sure. I mean, because you actually were invited to the combine. Yeah. You were with these guys. Mm -hmm. You know, you did the wonder with them. I did mine in the cafeteria at Akron. So <laughs> was, I, was I don't in the know. Cafeteria too, yeah, but you were with the big dogs. I was with, never I mind. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna do y'all like that. Test, after. What year? What year did you do the Wonder Lake? Uh, 2010. 2010. Yeah. How about you? Uh, 2009. 2009. So, I don't, I don't even know what, what I got on my test. I was so pissed off that only one scout showed up. <laughs> oh, for your pro day? Yeah, it was trash. Yeah, yeah, the Browns. That's messed up. They knew you were a Steelers fan, so yeah, they, they walked away. They were like, oh. <laughs> Basketball. What about basketball? You play ball a little bit? I'm terrible. Okay. All right. Well, no, no, look, I like <laughs> basketball. Look, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I like basketball. Yeah. Uh, I like the team aspect of basketball. Uh, but I'm not a good basketball player. I, I, I'll, I'll D up on anybody because I'll foul you. You know, I get five of them, I'm gone. But, I'll, yeah, hey, that's it. That's I'm it. Mad. Slow motion. Play some defense. Hey, play some defense. <laughs> play some defense. Hey, listen, man. listen. No Sean, when you say anything defense, say defense. Don't just yeah. say I'll play some D. Yeah. All right? Because that don't fly around here. You're going to get paused all day. All right. What? <laughs> you know? But no. Um, oh, I got it. You got it. Uh, yeah. It's clicking now. <laughs> it's oh, clicking now. Okay. It's clicking now. <laughs> I'll play some D. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> So listen. So no, 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 no. It's defense. All right. <laughs> Wait a <laughs> minute. I'm gonna clarify that right now. Appreciate you. All right. So we're in a NFL season is over. You know, you got guys who just lost the Super Bowl going into an off season. Um, who knows how those guys are feeling? And this takes me into the mental health aspect of being an athlete. Some of those guys who just lost the Super Bowl may not get their contracts renewed. Uh, they may 
be old enough feeling like they still can play, but they may not get another contract, and that may have been their last chance. Uh, and I know for me, when I was done playing ball, I knew I was done, but I missed the game a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can attest to the same thing. 100%. You know, we, we still think about it. Um, so mental health is, I think it's starting to be more um, noticed and respected when it comes to athletics. Uh, but another thing, CTE. Uh, we, as football players, get hit a lot in our head. O-linemen, D-linemen, uh, receivers coming across the middle, running backs. I mean, if you was like myself, you know, you leave with your shoulder. I've been blessed to never have a concussion. Unlike my counterpart, Amy. Too Amy, many. Amy. <laughs> yeah, you know, he, he, he's had, he had a Too few, many. you know. Yeah. Um, but that's a serious thing. So if you want to touch on CTE, I know you had concussions. I don't know how it felt. Do you think that maybe you could develop CTE because of the amount of concussions you've had? Do you have it? Because sometimes you actually... No, I, okay. I don't think. <laughs> I, was, I was goofy before the uh, concussion. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't think I don't think I had it. I don't want to, you know, obviously you can't rule anything out right, like that. Sure. You know, I mean, studies have to be done, tests have to be ran, things like that. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I've had quite a few concussions, some, some mild, some severe. I mean, you know, <clears throat> one of my worst concussions was actually in college. Penn State playing against Ohio State. And it hit so hard that I still, unless you turn on the film and play it for me, I don't remember the first half of the fourth quarter. This was at the horseshoe. This was at the horseshoe. I remember. Yep. Y'all won. We won that game. Yeah. We won that game. And um, Coach Jay Paterno told me that I was in autopilot for at least three possessions. Yeah. AQ Shipley, my center, he said he saw a glazed look in my eye um, after the hit. But I kept telling him I wasn't trying to come out of the game. Right. I was pulled out of the game when the team doctor pulled me to the side after one of our possessions. And he looked me in the eye and he got on the headset and told Jay, because he was in the uh, press box, um, Daryl doesn't look right. And I'm still trying to get back into the game to the point where they had to take my helmet. Yeah. I don't remember that unless you play the tape. That's how bad that. Um, concussion was and I've had mm -hmm. a, I had one um, another time a couple of years back uh, still in college uh, against Michigan it wasn't as bad and I had two when I was in high school so uh, one too many you know um, what games in high school do you remember you probably wouldn't no uh, I think it was the, I, I can't remember the team CT. name yeah whatever man that's nothing to play with <laughs> I know it ain't that's nothing to play with <laughs> but no no um, see but it is, like you said, it is something serious to take, and uh, it, it has to be taken serious. It's something that um, has to be paid attention to when it comes to the way people think, the way people react as they move on after the injury, because it can be, from what I've learned, it can be maybe not some effects that happen right after the impact or right after days after, weeks after, but down the line. Right. Um, years down the line. Mm -hmm. We see behavior changes, uh, memory loss. Uh -huh. uh, Mood swings. Yeah. Um, Damn, I, did you just have an episode? Yeah. Thinking, I mean, memory loss, and then you start moving around. I was, yeah, I just, I just had a thought of one. That, but, um, no, I don't think I have CT or anything like that. But I do know that uh, concussions are nothing to play with. I'm mm -hmm. glad now because back in your day when they played, you get a, you get your bell rung. Yeah. They asked you if you were okay, and then they put you right back in the cab. No, they never asked you. Oh, they just. <laughs> Suck it up. They were like, hey, put some dirt on it. And you got to go back. Suck you know? it up and keep rolling. Yeah, that's exactly what it sure. was. Being in the military, uh, CTE is, is a real thing, too. How does that CTE and PTSD, do they combine? Or are they separate? Well, th no, they're not combined. So they are separate. But okay. um, they now classify CTE um, as TBI. Traumatic brain So the traumatic brain, brain injury, injury is what causes... The CTE, right? And so, um, unfortunately, um, back when I was in, they they didn't have a baseline, so they never really did any mental testing as far as you know getting a CAT scan of your brain or getting a PET scan or any of that stuff. So that way they can see what portions of your brains are firing properly and what portions of your brain are not. Mm -hmm. And so, um, when you get blown up. And um, anyone who has been to combat, it's, it's, it's like the, 
that an, an IED or some sort of explosive device got blown up near them or they, you know, they got their bell rung um, in a vehicle even, you know, or um, they got run over by a truck wow. <laughs> or, you know, um, so, um, and, and those injuries, um, they mount up. And mm-hmm. so th- those traumatic brain injuries can also cause CTE. Um, the reason I think that football players are more pronounced, guys like Junior Seau, yeah. right, which yep. we were talking Absolutely. about, right. um, are because of the constant exposure, right, mm-hmm. of hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting, you know, um, and ignoring that mm-hmm. bell rung, yeah. ignoring, you know, the fact that you don't really remember, you know, and so uh, I think a, a lot of football players have that. But like you said, they're competitors. They they, they don't want to leave the game. Right. You know, they're trying to win. But in the military, um, you don't have a choice, really. I mean, um, where are you going to go? Right. Yeah. You kick in a door in, you hit an IED, you get your bell rung, but you still got to keep going. You got to clear the house. You got to. And, and these are obviously things that you have done. Yes. Yeah. So yes. CTE, you mentioned, you know, you broke that down nicely. And PTSD, something totally different. Yes. So PTSD, the post-traumatic stress, they right. call it a disorder. But now they're calling it PTSS, a post-traumatic stress symptoms, right? Um, because it's not a disorder, mm-hmm. right? It, the thing about post-traumatic stress and um, in life, we experience things that are traumatic, right? You get into a car accident, that's traumatic, right? You can have mm. post-traumatic stress from that traumatic like that, accident, sure. you know? So it's not just it's not just people from the military who's no, going their absolutely battles. absolutely not. No. I, I, well, you, when you say that, I got PTSD. I, you could, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, you know, and, and I, I think I, I talked to you about this before is um, any traumatic event Mm -hmm. that um, alters the way that you look at life going forward could be something that would be exposure for post-traumatic stress, right? right? And so, um, I mean, it could be, it it could be you're a clerk at a store, right? Okay. And somebody comes in and robs you, puts a gun to your face, robs you. Yes. Traumatic. That yeah. clerk right there, for the rest of their life, would be looking at people a certain way, going, "Oh, yeah. oh man, you know, I, I, yeah. I can't, I, I can't work in a store like that no more. I right. can't do this anymore." That's post traumatic stress, you know, a, a battered woman, yeah. right? Who, um, you know, my mom, who was beat up by her husband, you know, how can she look at a man who says he loves her from that point on? And not go, I wonder if it's going to happen again. That's post-traumatic stress. I remember a time I was, uh, I think it was Oak Street. Yeah, Oak Street. McCartney, I'm sorry. Remember the the, the gas station you get the chicken and stuff from? Right across the street from the auto zone. Mm -hmm. I was walking in there. I was probably about 13, 14 years old. And there's a guy that came to me with his hands in his pocket. And... He made a movement so quick that I thought he was pulling out a gun. And I like froze up and I'm like, yo. And he's like, hey man, you got some change? Like that messed me up for a minute. Right. So from the moment anybody would walk up to me, you know, kind of weirdly with their hands in their pockets, I'm what you would call get offline. Right. Hey, mm-hmm. you good? You know, yeah. like, what's, what's going on? You know, gotta check. what's up? You need something? Or I'm gonna be loud. Hey, this your boy? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because somebody gotta know if this dude pull out a gun and shoot me, he did it. You yeah, know what I, I mean? So PTSD, okay. And the way you explain it, yeah, I'm, I got PTSD. S, S, you know? Yeah. S, and that's wild. Um, now, here's the crazy thing. Yeah. You ready? What we ask young folks to do in the military, mm-hmm. we take them out of high school, 18 years old, and we send them overseas and say, defend our country. And they see some of the most horrific things ever ever right mangled bodies their friends dead injured they 
have to pick their friend's body parts up off the ground so they're so dogs don't eat it you know um we ask these young folks to go out there and we ask them to you know we train them to go to war but when they get back we don't give them the services to help them get back into society mm -hmm. to be a contributing member of society we just okay now you're good back here so do it you know, we don't think that those things that an 18 year old mind who's still forming, who's still trying to figure out who they are, mm -hmm. 19 year old kid who, because um, it's not normal to take people's lives, right? But you go over there and you do, and you still haven't processed it thoroughly. And mm -hmm. you come back and you have those nightmares, you have those things. So, yes, it, it is a real thing. And the VA has gotten better at it. I'll be honest with you, the VA has gotten better at it in the military has gotten better at it That's because but it, can, it can still be better. It can be better. Absolutely. So, um, so you, you, you mentioned, you know, kids and yeah, kids, 18 year old going out there for war. And then I'm looking at the shirt, you know, nine 11. And I can remember where I was, uh, September 11, uh, 2001. I was in between classes going to Spanish class mm -hmm. and we never turned our TVs on in school. And all of a sudden it was on, so I got in there and I'm like, what's going on? And me, I was a class clown and not knowing the severity of what was actually going on. I'm like, ah, oh, somebody just didn't know how to you know, fly a plane and ran into a building. Mm -hmm. Ha ha, he he, you know? But as we continue to watch and no classes were being taught and they're paying attention, I'm like, oh snap. Yep. So I can remember where I was. was that, <clears throat> I'm sure you was in the same was school. In, yeah, yeah, we, we both with the Earth in I was in classes. literature class. In, literature, on the way to literature class, yep. yep. Sit down, they turn the TV on. I think I was having a couple of conversations with a few friends, a few classmates, mm -hmm. not necessarily paying attention because, again, thought it was just. But then as it went on, you start realizing the severity of the situation right. and what's going on on TV. And then it's like, oh, wow, hold on, this is a real deal. Yeah. You know? My first thought is, we're about to go to war. I mean, that's what ended up happening. Yep. Where were you at that time? I actually had just arrived. We were training Saudi Special Forces. Um, I was on deployment in the Marine Corps. And we had just finished training Saudi Special Forces in Saudi Arabia. And they were going to give us two weeks off, so we were going to spend that in Australia. We literally had pulled in to the port that afternoon. Mm -hmm. you, and when you pull into port, you got to clean the ships. You got to make sure all your stuff is dry. You got to do everything else before they let you loose on liberty. Right. So the time difference here and there, right? So we, we all got off. We all got off the ship, and then we went uh, to the bars, and we were all getting ready to party, and we were all getting ready to let loose. And um, let loose. All of, the, all of the lights in these bars just turned on. Mm -hmm. And we were like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and they turned the TVs on. And within six hours, thousands of Marines and sailors had already gone back to the ship. We were missing no one. Six hours. Within six hours, thousands of people who just got let loose for two weeks Ready to back go. at the ship on their way to handle business in Afghanistan. What was your initial thought? We're at war. No fear. We're at oh, fear. Mm -hmm. Fear of what? Uh, fear of the unknown. Like we, nobody knew really what happened. Everybody thought, but nobody really knew. And, um, oh, by the way, you know, Afghanistan is not an easy place to fight. Right. Uh, matter of fact, they beat the Russians. And, and we knew that. So, you know, we're going to fight them on their turf. We're going to fight them in their terrain. We're going to fight them where they've been fighting for thousands of years. DC, sorry if you have questions. I'm just, just no, by no, listening no. to my uh, follow-up questions. No. This may go beyond what we need. Yeah, no. I'm sorry. No, no. You, good. you said Afghanistan, but within six hours, you guys were already ready to go. Yep. How did you know that it was Afghanistan that did it? The intelligence community knew, and they had claimed it. Mm -hmm. You know, Osama bin Laden had claimed it. Yeah. I mean, he put out there, we did it. We did it, right. 
<clears throat> you know, and so um, and and all nineteen of the pilots were from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. You know, it it wasn't a secret. They they had been following them, you know, but they just didn't put the points together yet. But when we were on our ships heading back out there, because we we knew where we were going, um, we just didn't know exactly where. And so um, that was September 11th, right, for us. And Same day. Uh, same day. Right to it. Went out right to church, it. Right back. Wow. Right to it. And we uh, we were the uh, some of the first guys on the on the ground, you know. So um, you know, October, we were on the ground prosecuting targets. So knowing that uh, they did that, and uh, and we're not going to stop till we get everybody associated with it. I can only speak from an athletic point of view. You know what I mean? If somebody goes out and purposely hurts my quarterback, I'm going for blood. Mm -hmm. And for you and the rest of the Marines and soldiers to feel the way that you feel, like, yo, we, we're prosecuting everybody who has something to do with this. It's like, I feel that. Mm -hmm. Not the way that you feel it, but I, I, I can feel that. You know, and that's just... I think I told you this before, bro, like, I spent enough time around you, uh, the respect I have for you, the respect people have for you, uh, the way people talk sometimes about you, and you know, I obviously don't do it around me, but it's like, I'm a rock with you. Yeah. And if something went down and you said, Alan, hey, I need you for this or that, you know what I mean? I got you. Obviously legal things, legal things. <laughs> I got you, you know what I mean? Because of the way you tell this story and you're so passionate and you mean it. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, my fault. No mean to get sentimental. Um, but yeah, so like you said, in October, you guys were on the ground prosecuting targets, doing what you need to do. Was that your only mission at that time? No, our, our mission at that time was to, uh, first off, we did something that had never been done in the history of the military. Um, and that's get, we did the furthest, longest over the, from the sea to Afghanistan um, aerial insertion. So we stopped in Pakistan, we stayed, you know, went into Afghanistan. I, I think we can talk about this, but it's all, you know, people have written books about it, so I'm pretty sure we right. can talk about it now. At the, t at the time, it, it was top secret because it had never been done before. So, um, and then we went into Afghanistan and we literally were looking for the high value target leaders who were the funding behind mm. all of it and intel gave you this yep and where they would be at yeah so you guys knew where to look they're no longer with us um, say less <laughs> okay then you say they you mean the people on our side or no the people no, okay. who funded all right just, yeah. funded just just wanted to yeah. be sure Got just wanted to be sure here. um so about how long did it take for that to be done because uh, the war continued to the go. war continued to go and um and it took years because uh people were hiding places mm. and although our intelligence assets and intelligence and you know we like to believe is the greatest you know ever um you know people can hide yeah. and when you hide in the mountains and you hide in little villages and people are lending support and all that stuff. And, 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 oh, by the way, when you go in and you know that bad guy's in that area, but you don't, you want to minimize the collateral damage, mm -hmm. right? So if I go in to get him, I know probably these little kids are going to get hurt. Or these, you know, these older ladies are going to get hurt. So we, we have to be patient. We have to bide our time. When I can catch him by himself and he's slipping. Now we talk about I talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I get it. <laughs> and that was from what, 2001 until? So we got there, like I said, October, late October 2001, and I stayed there um, until April, I think, of 2002. Um, Is there a time which, limit that you can stay? 
it, yes and no. I mean, our normal deployments are like six to seven months okay. for the Marine Corps. But, oh, okay. um, you know, uh, other like the Army, they go for a year. But they have a much bigger footprint. Like they bring so much more. Mm-hmm. Like we didn't even bring cold weather gear. And it was the winter in mm-hmm. Afghanistan. It's the coldest I've ever been in my whole life. Wow. Coldest yeah. i ever been. I, I'll tell you this. We took down a factory. And uh, in order for us not to f- feel like we were freezing to death, we actually layered with potato sacks. Layered. We put potato sacks in our boots. We put potato sacks under our pants. We put potato sacks under our shirts. After you took over the factory. After we took over the factory. Because we didn't have any cold weather gear. You got to remember, when we left, it was summertime. Summertime, right. right. And so we didn't have any That's cold right. weather gear. So when you say take over a factory, so you, hey, listen, this is what we need. We going in there, and we're taking it over, and we're taking your potato sacks. No, um, was this it? factory is sponsored by this person mm-hmm. who was a terrorist, mm-hmm. and we're going in there to make sure that that terrorist no longer is there. And so once we take that factory over, um, that's that, that's not that's, mine. That's yours. That's mine. Mm-hmm. And if we need it to use it. Uh, to to stage vehicles, to stage drones, to stage oh whatever, then that's what we have to do. So y'all really taking over, like taking, taking over. it over. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, the, and, and that's what the Marine Corps is good at, right? So we're we're good at doing the immediate fight, right? Right, but we're not good at holding stuff because we're not big enough. Mm-hmm. And all of the Marine Corps is like one hundred seventy thousand Marines, mm-hmm. right? And so. We're good at that tip of the spear where we're going to go in and target what we do. Right. And, you know, find the bad guys where they're at. But we can't hold it for long durations of time. Gotcha. Right that's, where, that. that's where we have to marry up with the Army. Army, let them. And they come in with the heavy footprint. Mm-hmm. They bring tanks and they bring armored vehicles and they bring so much equipment with them. That they can sustain for long periods of time. Yes. April, you got out of there. Yep. Did you come back stateside? Came back stateside. Did you have to stay a certain amount of time? We were supposed to, yep. And so um, from 2002 to 2004, I went over and um, I was the chief instructor for uh, the RAIDS branch for the Marine Corps, for all of the West Coast. So okay. I taught people how to do over-the-horizon raids, like from the ocean, to come in and, you know, be sneaky and come in and, and you know, again, prosecute targets and, and then get out. This was know? just all training, though. This was all training. So no deployment. You were just over on the West Coast for right. two years? For about 18 months. 18 months. Yeah, and then um, uh, in 2004, I went to Iraq. Um, for the first time. 2004, you went to yeah. Iraq. Um, and I was with a uh, a different unit, and I was there for about seven months. Mm-hmm. Came back, um, accomplished a lot, and then um, because that was almost like back-to-back deployments for combat tours, they said, hey, you're either going to have to take a break or you need to attach yourself to this unit Boom, stop right there. I know where you're going. Before we get into that, Afghanistan, back for um, D.C., I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. You're good. I'm just, I'm letting it all process. Absolutely. Uh, Me too. Back for a little bit. Went to the West Coast for 18 months. Deployed to Iraq. Mm -hmm. But originally you were in Afghanistan. That's where the war was at. Why did you go to Iraq? Because um, Saddam Hussein, who obviously was the leader of Iraq at the time, um, was one of the biggest sponsors of terrorism in the world. Okay. And um, the he's war no on terror. With us. He's no longer with us. Yeah. So the war on terror is on, mm-hmm. right? And so, um, but it started, the catalyst was in Afghanistan. But once the intelligence community started peeling back layers, they're like, whoa, we have these indicators that this is happening here and this is happening here. And so, um, uh, and, and we already knew Saddam Hussein was a really, really, really bad dude. Yep. Um, so um, 
um, because we had already been involved with him in the Gulf War. Mm. So, you know. First Gulf War. The first Gulf War. 91. Right. You were a part of. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Private we already knew. So I was a young man. Private first class Delgado. Yeah. I was a young man. EFC. Yeah. I but uh, so we already knew he was a bad man. His whole family were bad men. And, um, and they ruled that country with terror. And so um, we went in uh, in order to root out terrorism. And so, um, but he's no longer with us. So I don't know how much you can talk about that, but on that deployment was the, before you came back, was he no longer with us? That's correct. Okay. No, I wasn't on that team. Mm -hmm. So to to you know uh, the 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 guys who were on that team, super skilled. Yeah. Um, found him hiding in the middle of a big field down in a rat hole where he had been holed up for a while, mm -hmm. and um, so they and I, I'll tell you how skilled they were. Right. Um, they went in and got him without killing him and turned him over to the people that he had been terrorizing. Wow. Um, wow. And they put him on trial on, for, for um, all of the war crimes that mm -hmm. he had committed. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't make sure he was no longer with us. They did. But they did. They left did. it in their hands. The Iraqis, the Iraqis took care of the Iraqi problem. Do you know or can you share how they took care of the problem? They hung the him. Yes. And they televised it nationally and let everybody see. They hung him right in the middle of the square of the, of the big castle that he built. Were there any um, U.S. military around when that happened or you guys got the heck up out of there? Oh, no, we were all around. Just, people just, just watch, just watch yeah. it. Well, I mean, they just need to make sure that things stayed secure, uh, because yeah, I mean, he had a big following. Right, he had, right, right. I mean, he had a lot of allies in the mm -hmm. Middle East that you know um, were saying we we're not going to let him be, you know, prosecuted um, for his crimes, and we're yeah. not going to let you, you know, uh, kill him or erase his memory. Right, you right. Know, and so he had a lot of, and don't forget, you know, uh, there was a lot of, uh, he did a lot through money, you know, um, there was a lot of corruption. And so uh, it was in a lot of people's best interest to keep him around because he was lining pockets. Wow. I can keep going, DC. If you got anything you want to ask, go ahead, bro. I guess it. <clears throat> Eventually, we would kind of migrate into, you know, uh, Lima Company. Yeah. Um, you spoke about allies. I had a question because when watching the um, the Combat Diaries documentary, um, Sergeant Steve Hicks, he spoke about at times you guys had to work with Iraqi soldiers um, together. And with everything that was going on at that time, and with your experience and everything you've seen, even though they were considered people to work with, like how how did you guys build that trust? How did you know they were an actual ally or a disguised insurgent? You didn't know, and that's the problem, right? Um, there and prior to that, there was a history of people who were Iraqi soldiers, who were embedded insurgents, who did kill American soldiers um, in the middle of a firefight. Um, and they were supposed to be on your side. Wow. Okay. So, um, so yes, you didn't really know. Um, but over, and you had to, unfortunately, take it at face value, right? right? Um, because this is not my country. This is their country. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, I want to leave this country, but I need to leave it to someone. Mm -hmm. Or it's going to be turned back over to the corrupt entities that were there before, right? And so um, I, I had a very, very direct conversation mm -hmm. with 
the the soldiers that that came to me because right. uh, they attached to my platoon and uh made sure they understood where they were going to be in the fight and how they were going to be used mm -hmm. um and if a gun was turned any other way except that way right. they ain't gonna make it home yeah yeah that I, that you kind of answered the the next add-on yeah. question was there any behavior you try to pay attention to oh absolutely you know? yes i mean because they were passing look they're we knew that there were already embedded insurgents and they passed information on like this is where they're going this is what they're doing you know so we wouldn't give them information necessarily like some of the leaders that we ended up doing many many missions with you got a respect for it, right you're like right. okay i can trust this dude you know one of the guys that that i did he was iraqi special forces and his name was Jabber, right? Oh. And um, warrior, warrior. His cousins had been tortured and killed by Hussein. His uncles had been tortured and killed because they were all because they were different Muslim, right? Um, and uh, his brother had been had been murdered by the insurgents. Like this dude, just wanted his country back and would do anything to get it back mm -hmm. and and he he was a he was hard um his brother right next to him got shot he left him there and chased the dudes that shot him and that that's who jobber was jobber was a warrior and every single time my my guys went out i was like yo yeah. let's go dog yeah mm -hmm. you're coming with us I you was. know and 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 he knew, because he knew we were gonna. He, he knew our squad, so he, he knew we were gonna go out and handle business. And if there was any question, like whether this is an Iraqi thing, there you go, job. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Handle it. Yep. Handle it. For sure. This is not my country. This is your country. So I'm not making decisions on Iraqi issues. Do what you want to do. Do what you got to do. Right. You still part of that death squad, but do what you got to do. Listen, so first tour over there in Iraq, you came back. They said you had to, you just touched on, like I said, Lima Company, you had to either take a break or you jo joined in as a, um, what, what do you call it? I don't want to miss uh, Inspector instructor staff. Okay. Uh, so for the first, yeah, to train the people who are getting ready to go back over. Okay. Because I had the most recent experience mm -hmm. and they wanted that processed over to the, to the, uh, to the reserve unit that was here who and, had no combat and they knew experience. that they were going to send the reserves they did mm -hmm. now did the reserves know that they were going to they, they, they did okay so it yeah. wasn't just like a surprise no they knew okay so just to touch on that lima company third battalion 25th marines reserve unit as you called it in the uh, combat diary 325 325 325 it's uh, out of columbus ohio and i think that's why it's you know it's a big deal deployed to iraq february 28th through september 30th 2005, seven months. Seven months. So, uh, in Iraq, Lima Company combat strength was 184 Marines. Is that correct? Uh, give or take. Give yeah. or take. Yep. yep. Lima received 59 Purple Hearts earned purple in that hearts. in that seven months. Yeah. And 23 were awarded. Say the word for me. Posthumously. Will you explain to the people what that means? So they were awarded to them after they were killed. So now you are there, they get deployed. Were you supposed to get deployed? Yes. Even though you had just been deployed, they sent you to a unit to train them up to get deployed again. So yes, because the way the Marine Corps does the inspector structure staff is it is in your best interest to train them up well because you're going with them, mm -hmm. right? And so- But I thought you said that they wanted you to either take a break or, you had an option. Right. And your option was to go train. I'm ready to go back, pretty yeah. much. I kind of snuck my way in there. You kind of sneaked your way into the I kind of snuck my way in there. <laughs> a little bit. I mean, no you know, pause, no pause. <laughs> I kind of, no, I'm saying, I, the, they, they gave options for us not to go. Mm -hmm. And I'm not doing that. Right. I'm training you to go. I believe in you enough. Mm -hmm. I'm going with you. For sure. And when we go, just look to the front because that's where I'll be. Yeah, yeah. Follow me. True leader. 
It's our leader. It's like we're not going to go to a football game, be coached all week, and then coach them and stay in the locker room. Oh, no. I right. get it. So, yeah, I, I right. get it from that right. aspect. Yep. Um, so let's talk about, um, if I say this wrong, correct me. You talked about going in and clearing a potato factory and making it your own, right? Haditha, Haditha Dam. Did I say yes. that right? You did. Okay, Haditha Dam became your operating Operate. base. Yes. Did you have to clear that? Or no, was... no. Um, the Haditha Dam, when we got there, had already been controlled. Um, By the Azerbaijanis? Azerbaijanis, yeah. yep. Yep. The Azerbaijanis um, came in because the Haditha Dam was a tactical um, strong point. Okay. Uh, it provided electricity to about a third of Iraq. And so that dam was a hydroelectric dam. Mm -hmm. right. And so all electricity that was produced by that dam was needed for a lot of the Middle East. So obviously it's a dam. How do you make yourself comfortable in a dam? There's no rooms. Like there's no bedrooms or anything. There's no beds. So you have to bring all of your own stuff in there. How do you make that home? Well, I mean... You, you basically sleep on a cot, uh -huh. right? And so you make every little nook and cranny into a room. Make it your own. Yeah, yeah you make it your own. And so um, there are, so when it was built, it's huge. Like to, to say a dam, um, it is, it, it's a really big dam. It's mm -hmm. not, it, it's not like um, the Griggs Reservoir Dam. It's, it's like the Hoover Dam. It's big. So, I mean, you can literally run one way and back and you're about a mile, you know? And so, I mean, it's a big, it's a big facility. So mm -hmm. they had, <clears throat> excuse me, they had places that workers were supposed to live there mm -hmm. and maintain it. If I'm there, you, you don't right. need to work there. You right. got to go, <laughs> you know? So, you, you know, and mm -hmm. so. You had a king size bed. Uh, okay. <laughs> he was living. I was good. doing all right. Yeah, I'm I sure. Was doing all right. You know, so, so. so it was all 184 Marine. Well, all, of there. Yes, okay, all of us. All of us there. Okay. All of us. All of us were there. Um, and, and, and including, uh, we also had attachments. That's why I say plus or minus because mm -hmm. we had a lot of attachments. So we had Amtrak guys who drove Amtraks and stuff. So they stayed there as well. You know, we had some tanks that that stayed there. We had all of our armory stuff there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was probably, at, at any given time, probably 250, 300 Marines staying at the dam. Before I push forward, I talked to um, a Marine who will remain nameless. Um, <laughs> and they talked about the first time that they went over to Iraq before, you know, them and company went. And he said, and I'm like, oh. I can't get in trouble for this. I don't know. It was just the information that was given to me. If I'm saying something wrong, shut me up. Their mission was to go through and, oh, no, you already said it, to assess the threat and take care of it. Like, yes. nothing should get close to you. Do what you're supposed to do. We're not there to be friends. We're here to take care of business. Um, he said that they were driving along a road and a vehicle was approaching quickly. And they're like, Nah, we want nothing close to us. And they took care of business. But inside of that vehicle was a husband driving his wife to the hospital because she was in labor. Yes. That's rough, man. It's rough. So we talked about PTSD. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it's one thing to eliminate the threat of an enemy. It's another thing to eliminate what your perceived threat was, and that's still a good shoot, right? Mm -hmm. But it's another thing to eliminate that, what you perceive to be a threat, and then find that out. Yeah. And so, you know, that PTSD, mm -hmm. PTSS, whatever you want to call it, they now have to process that and deal with that for the rest of their life. They took some innocent person's life because they were on their way to the hospital. Right. And, you know, I don't know how old that person was who you talked to, but if they were 19, 20, 21 years old, you yep. know, where their brain is still malleable, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how do you soak that in? And I asked this person, like I asked you earlier, I said, 
were you scared? Was there any part of fear in you? And their response was, no, there was no fear because we knew that the Iraqis were weak and they couldn't, I'm just, just telling you what was said, they were weak and they couldn't, for lack of a better words, F with us. Like we were, we were solid. There was no fear. They didn't have the things that we had. We had air support. We got tanks. You know, they had small armored vehicles and, you know, the AKs and everything. They didn't have light armor. They didn't have what we had, so there was no fear. That person probably wasn't in a lot of firefights. I'll be honest with you because, mm -hmm. you know, it's um, to say there's no fear. Uh, that, for me, um, there is there there is always some sort of fear mm -hmm. because um you know it, it, is it the fear that i'm going to be injured uh, maybe maybe not but is it the fear that i'm going to make a decision that i tell you to do something mm -hmm. or the fear that i tell you to do something and you get your life is now taken because of a decision i made right you know and so um so i i don't know how many engagements that particular individual made but i will tell you um j just like playing the game right how you have butterflies in there yes, sir so you hear people all the time say i never have butterflies when i play well i mean i don't know so you ain't getting in well that's what <laughs> i'm saying Th that's exactly. my point yeah. right so you have, ready you have those butterflies and and whether you call them fear whether you call them nerves whether you call them whatever but I don't know of one firefight that I ever got into that I wasn't like, okay, calm down. Mm -hmm. You know, you got this. You're, people are following you. Let's go. You know, and so um, then you have to depend on your training, right? And so to have ultimate confidence in your training, great. But there's still the fear of unknown because I never fought this guy before. Yeah. You know, I've never fought that guy. I don't know what he's bringing. And oh, by the way, Guerrilla warfare has been very effective throughout mankind, throughout history, to say we can win if we hold on. Mm -hmm. And they don't win without killing their enemy. And so um, now they did change their tactics. They didn't engage us as much individually with those AKs that you talked about. But they would blow us up on a regular right. basis. That was my, my, my next thing was from that first one, he said that the IEDs, correct? IEDs. Yeah. He said those weren't as prevalent as they were when Lima Company went over because they had to advance a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so the element of surprise, that's where they would try to do the IEDs. Yes. And so um, I'll get back to Lima. I'm sorry. No, you you, you, you got anything, bro? Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'll get on I, one. And, I do I do have one question. Yeah. In, the, in that documentary, uh, one of the reserves spoke about one of the uh, Marines that were not being deployed uh, about what it was like when they were there. And it kind of set somewhat of a false um, sort of expectation, basically saying, oh, you get there, they may put you somewhere that's maybe tucked off where you won't have any kind of firefights. Uh, you may have a mission, but you may not get deal with anything. And, and, and when you hear that, you know, it could make you believe that, okay, hopefully that does happen. Now, obviously with the training that you put them through, and if you were to hear something like that, you would probably reassure them like, hey, that might happen, but let's be realistic about mm -hmm. this. You know, has that ever, like when he spoke, was, has no, that, that ever been the case? That was true. Okay. Uh, there were people back in the rear saying, you're reserved, Marine. Right, you're, right, right. You're not, you're not going to get into any firefights. You're not going to do this. But you know what? Those people didn't go and go forward with us. They were the people who... You know, they were short timers. They were getting out. They were this and that. So they just assumed gotcha. that nobody would be getting into anything. Right. But when we went to California, see, that's where we break away, right? So we break away from Columbus, Ohio, and we go to California. And we go out to 29 Palms, where all they teach is war fighting, mm -hmm. right? And so we train everyone up there and change your mentality from... I'm a reserve Marine to I'm a war fighter and we're getting ready to go to war. And we expose people to, Hey, now it's real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going over and it's real. And I don't know that anybody really grasped that until that first round comes down range. And you're just like, 
whoa, what? Yeah. You it's, know. It's funny you say that. Not funny, but I'm glad you said that. But takes me to the next point. There was a quote that says, the most exciting thing, the most fun thing you will ever experience when you're in a gunfight. That's what, you know, in a documentary, someone said that. It's like the most exciting, most fun thing until the bad stuff start happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's adrenaline talking. That's what he said. It was adrenaline. Yeah, that's adrenaline talking. So that's that's a young guy mm-hmm. that thought he tried to prove something to himself because we're that's what we do. And then adrenaline's kicking in because we're in now. You know, it, it's like training for the Super Bowl, right? And that is your Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. You're going now over to a country where you've been training for years potentially to see if you could actually accomplish this mission. Right. And so when those rounds start coming down, it's real. And so the adrenaline's running. And um but what you don't really think about is my partner just got shot in the face. My partner here just got blown up by an ID. And I still have to get that guy. And you don't think about those things until you do those things. And so, um, yes, that adrenaline, and, and people call it fun. They call it this and that. But they also call that fun when they drive 150 miles an hour down a freeway on a motorcycle yeah. until they don't drive 150 miles an hour down a freeway on a motorcycle. And then they'll no longer be with us. They're no right. longer with us. Correct. No mean to make a joke, but that's just how we are. Operation Matador. Okay. Uh, you talk about firefights it's fun not you but in the documentary it's fun it's the most you know greatest thing ever is like a video game someone said you know it's like a video game right um the correct me if i'm wrong the mission was to eliminate insurgent staging areas north of the euphrates river right you guys had no issues until you started to go in there until the game right yeah uh, yeah that's pretty accurate Talk to me about it. So, um, I think that that really put the insurgents on notice, right? When we're we're rolling in from Matador and and um, and we're coming in heavy. Everybody's coming in, and um, you know people are in these armored up vehicles, and um, and everybody's thinking, okay, this is you know we're Americans. What are you gonna do? Until you get blown up, mm-hmm. you know, and um, you know, until you lose your friends, right. and it gets real. Yeah. But Matador was, like you said, that was a stepping off point where we all knew from that point on, hey, we're in this, mm-hmm. and um, we're gonna. Uh, we're going to stay focused and we're going to, you know, cause you don't have, you can't let down, you know, and, and what you have to remember too is even though, um, we're a company, we're like, yeah, first platoon is over here. Second platoon is over here. Third platoon is over here. And then you got weapons platoon who somehow were able to obtain vehicles for themselves and paint these skulls and crossbones on them. Were you weapons put them? Yeah. Weapons okay. put them. Yeah, yeah that's just a little smile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, and so you know, and and so we were in Humvees. All of Weapons Platoon was in Humvees because remember, I had already been in Iraq. I knew they were targeting armored vehicles, so I'm not putting my guys in those vehicles. We're going to be over here, and we're going to be a quick strike unit. And we're going, I'm going to find you where you're at. And you're no longer going to be with us. <laughs> so you're in a Humvee. Yep. And the other Marines you went with over there are in armored vehicles? Nope. They're all, well, the rest of Lima Company is in armored vehicles. Yes. That obviously, you gave them this intel that they're going to be targeting armored vehicles. Yes. How come they didn't do anything about it? Um, I think, so... Those Humvees actually belonged to the Army. Give me one. And uh, 
they didn't need them as much as we did. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if they missed them until we get until we got finished, because um, we <laughs> we turned them in at the end. Here you go. Yeah. And so I, I don't think that the Marine Corps um, really a, a, accounted because that was a, that was not a war that that they were ready to fight yet. Mm-hmm. And so that when they encountered that, they came at it with what they believed was a, a defensible weapon system, which mm-hmm. is the armored vehicles. Um, n- new, new you baby. Is that how you say it? Yeah. New you baby. And I believe in the documentary, that's when the first, you know, casualties happened. No, the or first, the, the, the first casualties happened. Um, I might've been new you baby. Cause that was, um, they said they had to fire fights and yeah. to die down a little bit. Yeah. And they wanted to go through and, you know, kick through the doors. And there was a, a person behind the door. Yes. And it was a young man. I don't know if you want the names to be said, and you know what I'm talking about. Um, turned away. Yep. Uh, was hit. Yeah. Legs. They, ex- um, the way they described it, they said when they saw him, his he looked gray. Yes. And another... Um, I want to say it was a sergeant went in to to save and try to you know eliminate the threat. Um, another guy said there was a, a closet there that he yeah. wasn't sure what, what, what was there, and he he tried his best to you know put a couple rounds down there, but then this sergeant, being a leader, stepping forward and opening it up, uh, it was at an angle, and then blast. Mm-hmm. What? I don't remember if that was in the documentary or not, but what that was was an anti-air weapon system hidden in that closet underneath that stairs. This was not a person. Oh, one person. It was a uh, it was a person firing that. So oh, that wow. was a that weapon system is what you use to shoot down airplanes, wow. not people. Mm-hmm. So when they went into that house, they were already locked up, ready to go, and just waited till we got close enough to be able to say we're going to definitely eliminate these dudes. And so, and they did. Um, they did. So. But they're no longer with us either. So. Right. I'm sure. So when something like that happens, you personally, where are you? Are you away from all of that? Or are you in a different area? I was there. Um, I wasn't at that house when that happened. Um and uh, we were fighting on another part of New Ubaidi. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we had heard over the radio, obviously, that this was going on. But you cannot detach from the fight that you're in. Of course, right? of course. Right? And so once we eliminated all threats from our area, um, posted guards, and we rolled over mm-hmm. um, to eliminate any threats in and around that area. Well, um you know, and so it actually took us a long time to get that guy out of there, to get to him, because he was he was bunkered in, he had sandbags around him, he mm-hmm. had like he was he was he was, he was ready, prepared. he was ready, yeah, and it's hard to fight somebody who's ready, yeah, it really is. Um, so with those you know casualties, um, and if you prefer me use another word, please tell me, and I don't want to be disrespectful at any time. Um, with those things happening, the mission was still push forward. Yes. Push forward. Yes. There's no stopping, like you said. It's if let's talk about the concussion thing. Nowadays, ah, he's out of the game. Back in your day, hey, keep going. Get back in the yeah. game and keep going. And the Marines, name a company, push forward. Yes. You do not have time to grieve. Right. We will grieve them later when this battle is done. Mm-hmm. When something like that happens, how much more pissed off do you get? Or do you have to stay level-headed? Uh, so that's kind of a loaded question, right? Because okay. as a leader, see, there's there's the Marines who were here who um, literally came from the same hometown, went to the same schools with them, mm-hmm. did all these other things with them, literally grew up with them, literally were their, like their brother. Yeah. Right? Um, and as a leader, you have to direct that energy 
and you can't be the person who freaks out when that happens. You've got to be the stabilizing force because if you fall apart, they fall apart. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, you give them a chance to express their grief a little bit and you step out yeah. and you let them know the battle's there. If you're mad, show me. Let's get to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the hearing this, bro, it's just like we lose a football game. We got a whole season ahead of us. And this, I'm, I'm not comparing the two, but the way that we can relate, the backfield. Yeah, yeah, you know absolutely. what I mean? Yeah. Hey, Coach, go ahead. No, Speak that's nothing. That. You know, <clears throat> yeah, it's just like what you were about to allude to. Your head coach comes to you, talks to you, and tells you, hey, what happened, happened. We didn't do what we were supposed to do. We can't talk in it. Be upset about it. Take that next week. Yeah, that's right. Next week, we moving forward. Mm -hmm. Again, not comparing the two. Right, right. Um, but it's relatable for sure. Wow. But keep I'm gonna keep pushing. Span of four days, eighteen Lima Company Marines were wounded. Eight KIA. Yes. Um let's talk to me about these Iraqi dogs. They spoke about the Iraqi dogs. Are are they really that vicious? Um they're hungry. Yeah. Like oh, literally man. hungry, like They're starving. Eat. Okay, uh, yeah. So in, I mean, they eat each other. Oh, cannibals. Yeah. So I mean, they're bad. It's they're they're blood. bad. But and and that's the thing is, um, <sighs> yes, uh, they're bad. They're bad dogs. And and I'll tell you, because um, I'm sure we're going to end up hitting this sooner or later. Go for um, it. So one of the the biggest explosion that I saw in combat was an Amtrak right here in front of me. Mm -hmm. I was in an Amtrak behind, behind me, it. and um, this Amtrak in front of me, 65 tons, is picked up and flipped over and is on fire. Yeah. And body parts flew out of the sides and the hatches and the doors of my guys, of our, our, our Marines. Mm -hmm. And as we're fighting off the insurgents, it was an ambush. Mm -hmm. So we're fighting off the insurgents and you look over and these wild dogs are trying to eat the body parts of your friends. So yes, they're terrible. They're, st they're starving, they're wild, you know, um, and they will eat whatever is out there to be eaten. So they're not caring about the gunfire that's going nope. on around. Mm -mm. Not even a little bit. Right in. Yep. Would they attack a, a human like yes. just walking? Yes. Go for the kill. Yes, okay. they will take them down like jackals. Wow. Yes. So they are definitely that's crazy. The guy said um, he'd rather deal with a bear than deal with the a dogs. bear. Yeah, because they were wild and and they didn't go by themselves. Mm -hmm. They Traveling they traveled dogs. in packs, so yeah. you know. Um, Clark, you had beat me to the point, which was great. Um, glad he answered it. It, uh, it was uh, working with the uh, Iraqi special forces. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things oh. I had, and so he he definitely um, covered that well. If you got anything else, uh, oh no, I, I keep uh, going. No, you keep like rolling. Yeah, keep it rolling. All right, keep it rolling. Um, Operation Spear. Yes. Okay. Uh, and if I pronounce this wrong, I apologize. Uh, Karabatha? Kar Karabatha, Iraq? Bitha. Bila. Bil oh, Balat. Let me see. How do you say it? You know I got no glasses on. <laughs> I can't see nothing. Money glass. Let me get him. And can you give me the things on the side of the refrigerator? Which one are you talking about? This one. Oh, Carabola. 
Garoppolo. Yeah, Garoppolo. Garoppolo. Garoppolo ironic. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um. So, from what I gather, there were two missions when it came to Garoppolo. The first mission was to find evidence that uh, foreigners were coming in. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. The Syrians. Yeah, the Syrians. Mm-hmm. Okay, yes. because the Euphrates River is right there. Yeah. The border of Syria. Yes. Okay. So, would would they want they wanted you guys to go get information to find out if it was true that the Syrians were coming in? What did you find out? Uh, we not only found out that they were coming over, but we also found evidence of torture chambers. Oh snap! So. Um, you know, what what we ended up doing was, uh, as we were clearing buildings, we found one of the buildings um, literally was set up with cameras and lights and uh, a, a torture situation where they were hanging them from the roof. and Them. Uh, hanging um, Iraqis and, and anybody captured helping us. Mm-hmm. Were they um, hang one of us? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, they captured a Navy SEAL friend of mine and hung him from an from an overpass and cut off his head. So, yes, they would. So at this point, you guys see this torture chambers. I'm sure you saw other things. The mission changed, correct? Yeah, it what, did. What did the mission change to you? <clears throat> what, what do you have there? Because it, it depends. Yeah. Uh, because we had we, you know, the mission changed to rules of engagement. Everyone Everybody. in the city is bad. Everybody's bad. So, I'm I'm glad they wrote that. I'm glad they, you know, because that was true, mm-hmm. right? So what we found out was that not only were the Syrians coming over, that um, everyone in that city was supporting terrorism, mm-hmm. and. Um, not o- not only that, but the terrorists that did come in there chased all the good people out. So the the people who <coughs> just wanted to be left alone, mm-hmm. just wanted to live, right. they could not live there mm-hmm. without being a part of them. Part of it, right. mm-hmm. You know, so um, the wow. the headquarters folks made a determination: it's not safe to be here without knowing that everybody's bad, and if everybody's bad. No matter which direction you shoot, get them out of there. It is what it is. Yeah, it is. So oh. mo- most of these, we talk about uh, Matador. Uh, we talked about Spear, and what do I miss? I think I said it so far. These were sweep and keep going. Yes, just, right. Because, like you said, there weren't enough. Um, Marines for you guys to sit there and hold and you know do whatever you let the army that's when you marry up with the army and let them do their things correct you guys had uh, Operation Sword okay and that was in Heat Heat Uh, yes and you said on the documentary this was a sweep and hold yes explain that to me so um, typically when we swept through uh, we didn't hold. Mm-hmm. Um, this one, if I remember heat correctly, is where we had to hold the bridge. Mm-hmm. And so, um, because we knew that that was a pipeline for getting explosives to this side okay. of the river, and um, that was hitting us with a lot of IDs. And so our our mission at that point in time was to hold that city and not let it go. I think you said the foreigners are now are the foreigners considered considered the Syrians. Um, well, a lot or of people were. Listen, um, when you're when you're an American, Everybody's people sure. come from all over the world to fight you, no matter where you're at. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. um, so so we had Somalis that were coming there to fight us. We had Chechnyans who were coming there to fight us. Mm-hmm. We had Syrians who were coming there to fight us. Iranians were coming there to fight us. So people were coming from all over the world to, to uh, uh, bring their own brand of terrorism to the table. Mm-hmm. 
and kill Americans. That was their that was their way to to make sure that they even flowed what was going to happen. So who was it that said, if anybody tries to come into heat and take it over, will die a fiery death? That was the Iraqi terrorists. That that was um, who was it? That was uh. I want to say they were the they were the affiliates of the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And and but once y'all got there, nobody was there. That looks like it's almost like as if they were. I don't know. Ran out before you got there. They were bluffing. Oh, Um, they so they ran their mouth. mm -hmm. Um. But uh, when you come into so when people say if you come in here you're going to die a fiery death, Mm -hmm. right? Well, you got to show me. I already know. You know, and so, um, you know, we we came in ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and, oh, by the way, uh, if we were going to die a fiery death, we were going to do it with tanks by our side. <laughs> so we brought tanks with us. And I don't think they wanted to dance around with no tanks that day. You know, so the tank commander was like, Shit, people are dying a fiery death. We're going to figure it out. You know, right. so... Right. Um, it, it it did not come to fruition, but they tried to take the city back. Yes, I was going to get to that. You said they tried to sneak around and, yeah. you know, plant these IEDs around. And um, somebody said, man, that's why I hate this effing country, man. And people are always trying to blow us up. And, yeah. you know, I felt that when he said that. Yeah. Um, you saw two little wires. IED went off. Um, Iraqi special forces were hit. Yeah. As well as, um, again, I'm going to keep the names anonymous, was hit. Um, you saw the the lines going into a mosque. The mosque. Yep. Oh, that was McCormick. Mm-hmm. They got hit. Yeah. McCormick. Yes. Yes. And um, it's just goofy, dude. You'll see in a second why I call him goofy. I remember the documentary. He 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 definitely had a goofy yeah. look to him. Yeah. He uh. He was wild. Mm-hmm. There's, yeah. So those are the first two that were, um, you're talking about with the anti-air weapon systems? Yes, sir. That's them. Yes, sir. And I, I look at these every day, man. So mm-hmm. it's um, just to remember my brothers. But yeah, that was my, that was my uh, corpsman that, that was killed that day. Um, and he told you, do not find another corpsman. He did. Back. He did. And you told him, I know you. Just just shut up. I, I got you. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I'm like, that's my point. They don't got him. I did. But but you said it in a way, I'm sure. Yes. It wasn't there, obviously. I'm sure you said it in a way in confidence. Like, hey, just calm down. I got it. You know, you'll be okay to comfort him. Yes. You know, and he, he didn't die from the actual... Uh, his injury per se, Correct. it was something else. Yes. Um, you know, from from that, which is uh but nonetheless still tragic, you know. Um, so he was talking he was talking to me. As as a matter of fact, you know, I I see it to this day because um, you know, I went up, I was applying the tourniquet, talking to him, and he was telling me, You're not applying that right. Yeah. You know, I'm like, shut up, you know. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. This ain't the first time I put one on. And he was like, you got to turn it this way. You got to turn it. I was like, man, would you? He was like, and so we were talking and kind of going back and forth, bantering like you, yeah. and, like you and I do sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, bantering back and forth. And to me, I was like, okay, I, I see him, you know, and, and his smart aleck nature is still there mm-hmm. and he's with me, you know, and, um, and my goal right now is to, is to get him the treatment that he needs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I thought maybe he would lose a leg. But what we didn't know at the time is um, when the IED went off, he breathed in. And the heat from the explosion burnt his lungs from the inside. Wow. And um, the nodules that it formed inside his lungs didn't burst until he got on the plane, got on the bird to be 
evacuated out. We got him out. And the whole time I was talking to him and, you know, he was like, don't get you another corpsman. Don't get another corpsman. I'm coming right back. You know, they're going to fix this and I'll be fine. Yeah. And, you know, so. I, Dedicated. Yeah. Hard. And, um, and I was like, well, I, dude, I'll take care. Don't worry about it. You know, um, but then I found out later and that one hit me. That one hit me because when I put him on the bird, I was fully expecting to see him again back home. Right, right. You know, but I never see him again. That's rough, man. I couldn't, couldn't imagine, you know, my guys here, um, even you, obviously, but seeing, you know, an injury. I'm like, all right, bro, you're going to be straight. And the next thing I know, he out for the season or his career is over. You know, obviously, and again, I'll keep repeating it. Um, Keep repeating it that it's not the same, but I, I can feel it in that way, you know. Um, you, I think it was him. You said he had, he his wife was pregnant at the yes. time. He had a three year old son, probably. Yes. You took it upon yourself to go in and write a letter to her, letting her know how important he was to your unit, how good of a guy he was to you um so that when his kids grew up yeah not only you know did he save you know marines but just other people in general he was a, he was a savior yes you know, he was a great person he was well, what makes you feel like you know what i'm going to go ahead and write a letter to you know his wife did you know her personally i didn't no. Um, so before we left, I looked every family member in the face. And I told them, I'm going to do everything I can to bring your Marine back home. And they entrusted them to me. So the least I could do is be the one to tell them what's, what's happened, how it happened. Because when they're informed... When somebody's killed, they come and say, we regret, we regret to inform you that your loved one has passed. Mm -hmm. right. But they don't tell them how important what they actually did was. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that the value that they brought to who, who they were right. was important. And their children are going to be growing up without their father. But they need to know the, the dedication and what their father gave was everything. Mm -hmm. And and I wanted them to know it. I wanted them to hear it from somebody who served with him. That's deep, man. Very deep. You guys obviously had a, a few more missions that you did. Um, I think one of the the bigger ones, and I think, like you said, you, you spoke about it. Um, Operation Quick Strike. Quick Strike. Was that the one that you spoke about with the trek in front and blew up and... You were uh, behind, or was that? That's the one. Yeah, that's what yeah. about. Yeah, that was the one with the Amtrak. That. So, so what I'm understanding is that you guys had to take the Iraqi Special Forces and their vehicles, but their vehicles kept getting stuck. Yes. And so, uh, the major made the decision after getting information from, I guess, a unit that went ahead with the tank, that hey, this road is clear. You guys are good to go. Yes. You guys are good to go. So the major made that decision to go ahead and do it, and then what you just said had happened. And do you feel like through all of that, obviously all of the tragedy is tough, but did that one hit you the hardest? Um, no, uh, that one didn't hit me the hardest. That, that one hit me hard. Um, the one that hit me the hardest was um, the IED that... Um, one of our Marines, uh, and he was on the documentary. His name is Mark Camp. Mark Camp, yep. Yeah. Yep. So Mark was in that Amtrak, and um, that was his squad in there. And he got blown clear of it, and it was on fire. Mm -hmm. And um, he could see his brothers in there, yeah. trapped. Yeah. So he literally put his whole upper body into that Amtrak to pull them out. 
and he he was all caught on fire, and then he got blown clear again. Again. Mm -hmm. That was some of the most heroic. That was, I mean. And then um, one of the Marines that got injured in that, his his legs were just gone. And uh, he refused to be evacuated because he didn't want to leave his brothers. And we had to tie him down on a gurney to get him onto the helicopter and the whole time he was fighting us because he did he he knew that if he left he was not coming back that one hit me hard that one that one is the one that when i close my eyes i see that one did he survive no he did not and then i definitely remember seeing you know hearing that and kept telling that story and he's a guy with the gloves i believe yeah and uh, before he even got to the store, it looked like he must have got burnt. He did. But Bad. His face was burnt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You couldn't really tell as much on that documentary because mm -hmm. he had gone through very extensive mm -hmm. skin grafts and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, it's one of the most heroic things I've ever seen in my life. And um, that hit me hard. That hit me real hard because we had to put him out. He was on fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he was still trying to pull. Do you still see those guys? I do. Uh, I see some of of our guys. Um, uh, every, every once in a while, we'll do a reunion. Okay. And we all get together. Um, but we do it away from people. Yeah, that's fair. Um, because some of these things that we never talked about, some of these things, uh, when you talk about post-traumatic stress, as you might imagine, you know, um, these things, you know, they are just now coming to where they could deal with them enough that they can say, hey, what happened at this? You know, and talk about it a and talk bit. about it a little bit. Right. You know. Um, October 7th was the return. Yes. Why did y'all receive so much attention? Um. Honestly, I think it was because the vast majority of our company was from Columbus, Ohio. And um, that at that point in time, that unit was the hardest hit unit mm -hmm. ever since Vietnam. And so um, all the funerals, a lot of people went to the funerals. There was a lot of media coverage about the funerals. But at the, I, I also think that um, Central Ohio is, in its very core, a patriotic area. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to say thank you. And honestly, I was extremely humbled by it. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. How many people were out there? I was like, what? I've been to war a bunch of times and this never happened. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, everywhere you look, people were lying in the streets yeah. saying thank you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. I watched, um, I watched your speech. Had your uniform on. Like, look at my boy looking sharp. See where I can get one of those from. You gotta earn it. <laughs> you gotta I, don't earn. Think, I don't think there's one that fits your back. <laughs> um, by, the, by, the, by the way, I, I don't know if you guys know. How old are you? 38. I'm 37. How old are you, Darnell? 34. 34. When's your birthday? August 14th. So this year you'll be 35. 35, yep. He led that unit. At 35 years old. Wow. 35 years old. I'm, wow. I'm 37. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I got my life okay. 
but I couldn't imagine myself. I mean, I can say that because I haven't done a training. My mindset, if I was doing a training, sure. But I cannot imagine myself going through what you've been through, right. doing the things that you've done at a high level. You, you've been shot before. Yeah. How many times? Eight. You've been shot eight times. Yeah. One less than 50. But on a serious note, eight times, bro. 50 wasn't shot with an AK, though. That's a different ball game, huh? And I know that I know we've been on this one for a while, yeah. But I'm sorry, I can't. Do, who who knows when we'll get another opportunity? You were in a firefight. You get shot one time, or did you get shot different eight times? Eight different times. So, so eight separate. Ex- four for one. One time you got shot four yeah. times, and then different times. Like I'm always the first one in the door. That's why. So, you know, um, I'm kicking it. I'm coming. And if you're going to fight me, you're going to have to earn it. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, fight coming with it. Yeah. Did, you know. did these happen in, w- w- when did you get shot? In Iraq. In Iraq? Yeah. So Not with Lima Company, though. It was the first time. Right. Yeah. So four, you got shot eight times the first time in Iraq. And on different occasions, yes. So, like, not in the same firefight. But in, in six yeah. months. But but it, it's different, right? So no, there's not uh, the no, there's not. See, this is the my man is saying is different. It's it's different because uh, we got gear, right? Yes. And that gear that we have saves lives. Okay. Those those surgeons that we have on the battlefield save lives. Like you know something fifty years ago that you would have got shot through the shoulder, you could die. Yeah. In Civil War, they got shot in the leg, they died. Right, right. You know. Um, so, you know, you get hit and it's about mental toughness. Of course. Cause you got to say, you know what? Just get me to the surgeon. Mm-hmm. So these are not, these shots actually flesh. The ones up here did. Uh, um, and everything else and, was kind of in the, body I, armor. The one that I got shot four times was four times right here. Boom, 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 boom. Body armor. In the body armor. And that dude had a good group. Yeah. He didn't make it, though. <laughs> he didn't make it, though. Oh, man. That's um, usually the end result. That's usually the end result. With don't, don't miss. Um, I, I want to ask this question so bad, but I'm a, I'll ask you off stream. Um, what did you say? Uh, my son saved my sanity. Yes. I will tell you that for sure. Although things with him can be crazy, you laugh a little bit. He's my rock. He's my anchor. Whenever things get hard, I just have to look at him and uh, know that I need to be with him for him to raise a good man, no God. True. So how often when you're deployed are you thinking about getting back? To the I didn't have, I, I, don't, I, I was married when I was deployed. Mm-hmm. But um, my son was born July 6, 2006. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. After we got back. Okay, I get it now. So that makes sense. So, um, but I was in a I was in a scary place then, because mm-hmm. I just lost all my guys, and I was getting ready. I, I was getting ready to um, take on a different job overseas, and um, when Dominic was born. I had to look and say, if something happens to me, who's going to raise my son? Mm-hmm. And nobody's going to raise my son the way I'm going to raise Absolutely. my son. Absolutely. So, um, and and um, that helped me get to a better place because it also helped me need, get to know that I needed help. Mm-hmm. I needed to be able to reach out to get help. I needed to, I needed to ask for help, um, and uh, and and accept that help. Because I, I was mentally, I was very angry, very, very, very angry man. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, things could trip my trigger like you wouldn't believe. And so, um, you know, I, I had to figure out what those triggers were, figure out tools to deal with them, and then and, and incorporate that in my life. And, and, and honestly, part of that was um, forgiving myself. 
for a lot of the things that I, I did. Mm -hmm. um, because the way I looked at it is if God can forgive me, I, I, I can forgive myself. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and so I turned my life over to Christ and, um, and I committed to being a follower of Christ. Um, and that changed my outlook on life. You said something about things making you angry. And I know after, I believe this is after you retired, you've uh, been a successful entrepreneur. You know, you've, you've done your thing. You told me a story about you going to work one day and being in a car accident. Yes. Tell, tell, uh, tell the camera about this one. That's the only, the only flashback that I ever had. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, it actually, that scared me mm -hmm. because I'm driving my truck to work. Um, and luckily I didn't have my son in the car. The car seat was there, but, uh, he wasn't in the truck. Right. And, um, at the corner of fourth and rich, mm -hmm. right by the old Greyhound bus station. Yep. A, a yellow cab ran the red light um, and T-boned me. He was going about 55 miles an hour downtown. He flipped my truck on its side. Um, and I literally thought I just got blown up by an IED. I could smell the gunpowder. I could smell. I literally was back there. And I was armed. So I climbed out of my truck, ready to get busy. And um, to this day, I, I, it's comical to me today, um, but I was ready. And there were four construction people, like road construction, standing on the side of the road, had the yellow and all that stuff. They saw me climb out that truck, bleeding everywhere, with the gun in my hand. They were like, pew! They wanted nothing to do know. with it. They wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah, and um yeah. and and I saw the I saw the cab that hit me. So I'm approaching it. Right? And I'm thinking this I'm I'm literally thinking he attacked me. But he's laying into the steering wheel. And then I'm looking around, I'm like, whoa. This ain't Iraq. And this guy's dead. Yeah. The one that hit me, he's dead. Was he really dead? He was dead. Oh, snap. Yeah. So I put my pistol away, and I'm like, I, I can't believe just what, what just happened. Yeah. You know, and um, then Columbus police came and um, took my gun. <laughs> They're like, no, yeah. <laughs> you can't have that. But, um, you know, uh, but that was the only time ever that I had a flashback because um, I literally thought I, I had been blown up again. Mm -hmm. And it yeah, took me right back there, you know. Cab driver, did you say, what was the cab driver? He was a Somali. And you said you've dealt with a lot of Somalis. Yeah. So did that play a part in? It probably did. It probably did because I was, like I said, I was ready. Um, and I honestly, I don't know. 100% because I, I had no idea who hit me, right, right. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so when I climbed out of that vehicle, though, we were going to find out, you know. If we're going to find out. Yeah. yeah. I was yeah. just curious. You know, so. Um, and make it so bad, he wasn't even the regular cab driver. He wasn't covered by insurance or nothing. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to say my comment. I was about to yep. say. It, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my own insurance had to pay that so um, one more quote sure none of us want the marines or anyone from Lima company to be remembered for their death Delgado said please never forget why marines soldiers sailors and airmen go forward and that's to push the cause of freedom still believe that today that's your words that's my words you see, you got something you want to say? Mm -mm. No, I, be, I just believe in everything that you just, it's just a very strong message. Very strong message. So, Sean, 
none of us want the Lima company to be remembered for their death. What 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 do you want to say to you know anyone who may see this so that they are remembered for more than just that? I know you brought some pictures up. <clears throat> Actually, I'm sorry, I, I forgot something real quick, John. I'm gonna come back to it. I'm gonna let you do that. I okay. Promise. <laughs> Man. All right. Gunnery Gunnery Sergeant Sean C. What's your middle name? Christopher. Christopher. Okay, I can deal with that. Delgado. 15 August 88. Is that when you went in? Yep. Until 31st of August 2008. Semper Fi. So if you want to hold this and kind of just explain what we got in there. So what we have in here is you talked about the Bronze Star. Yes, sir. Um, with the V for Valor. So you earn that in combat. How's it? Can we get a good visual on it? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so you earn that in combat. And then there's the Purple Heart next okay. to it. Um, and then all of these medals that you see and the ribbons up top are mm -hmm. awards that I was issued while I was in the Marine Corps. Okay, what are the re rewards? I'm sorry, awards. Um, most of them are for, the, like the first row are all, all those were earned in combat. Mm -hmm. um, and then these others were earned for going to combat. And I mean, just, there's a whole lot. The ones at the top. Yeah. Are the, do those signify the same thing at the bottom? Just No, like metal there's all, all of these are for something different. I mean, like the top above your name. Oh, no. So that uh, up there uh, is, is like, Group like those are things that that I earned being a part of a comp a, a unit or something okay, like so. Got you. And the one up top is a recruiting ribbon. Okay, I, I never really talked about that, you know, um, because you recruit people, but that ain't part of war fighting. Right, right. You know, and so, but I was a good recruiter though. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it too. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. You can set it right down next to you. Um, and and again, like I said, um, they never want to be remembered for their deaths. So um, you have your pictures there. If you want to hold them up and show them, or if you just want to say whatever it is you want to say, so they can be remembered for more well, than just that. There, there is a. So what these pictures are is um, all of our guys that were killed during that deployment. And um, my wife and I have these on the corner of our refrigerator. And we have coffee every day. So every day we get to look at these and see our guys every day, right? And be thankful for the freedoms that, that again, that they provide for us, that they, they gave the ultimate. No one took their lives. They didn't take their lives. They gave their lives. Absolutely. Right? And so um, they went over voluntarily. They um, gave voluntarily. And um, they believed 100% in America and everything that America stands for. And um, they accepted the mission that was given to them. And they knew that the chance, the, the possibility that they may not come home was there. Right. And so um, that's love. And like I, I, I think I told you earlier is, um, you know, one of the things that we say in, in the military is worse than death is to be forgotten. Yeah. You know, because the sacrifices that they made that their families make still to this day, to this day. Yep. right? Um, their families will forever miss them. But that's also part of that sacrifice, you know? And so um, their friends, their coworkers, you know, everybody who knew or were associated with them gave a piece of themselves when they went over and didn't come back. Please don't forget them for that. For sure. Right? Because 
That's love. That's love for your country. That's love for your family. That's love for your, where you come from, your high school, your friends. That's, that's love because you're going over there to represent that knowing that you might not come back. D.C., Mr. Jim. That was, that was, I don't know if I can top that, y'all. I will say this. I um, spoke about it earlier. Um, Microphone. Oh. I uh, did speak about it earlier. Today, I was uh, very excited to finally get a chance to meet Mr. Delgado. And uh, I just want to thank him again for taking the time to share everything that he shared with us today. It really means so much. It's remarkable. It's, it's, been a, it's, it's been a great pleasure just sitting as you guys go back and forth and share your stories. You obviously didn't have to do that, but I learned a lot today. Um, and again, you know, cherish every moment, you know, in anything that you do. Obviously, you probably know this more than any of us, obviously. You know, but it's extremely important to always show love, always show support, never forget your your loved ones. And um, again, I just can't thank you enough. I there were a couple of times where I were I was kind of getting emotional, just, mm -hmm. um, just just listening to it and you know watching the the documentary and everything too, and seeing some of the the stories and seeing some of the videos from some of the reserves reaching out to their daughters back at home, you know, and the sacrifices they, they made to go over there and telling the kids that they would be home soon, not necessarily knowing if they would make it back. But um, you know, um, just sitting here, it just, it just gave me chills. But again, I don't mean to ramble, but I, I just want to take the time to thank you again for uh, all that you've done. Thank you, sir. And, uh, It'll always be appreciated. That's real. Um, that is a finishing gem. Um, I want to second thanking you, obviously, as a friend and a brother. I tell you, I love you all the time, and I mean it. Uh, when you were over there doing your thing, you allowed the freedoms for Daryl and I to continue to play football, you know, because we had no idea what you guys are going through over there at that point in time. We sweat and complaining about up downs and going to you know lift weights and doing all of this, but y'all are fighting for our freedom, and that is definitely appreciated. And like I told you before, and I mean it, if you need me for anything, if you teach me to be equipped to help you build a house, <laughs> you know what I mean. I got you, bro. Got you. I got you. So I definitely appreciate you. I love you like my own brother. I'm sure Daryl and I we're going to sit back and reflect and. Talk about this. I know Darnell felt it. Um, this was good. And, and and we put together some good segments for this to be our fourth. Mm -hmm. I, I would go out and let me say this is our best one right now. You know? That's because I was I, in it. I was absolutely. Just, <laughs> that goes absolutely. without saying, Drain, absolutely. I, Not as pretty as him, but, you know. <laughs> but this was, uh, we like DC said, <laughs> like DC said, we definitely appreciate you sharing your story and shedding light and, um, you know, on your guys and, Man, that's just awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing we always do, you got anything else you got to say? No. One thing we always do, we got to let the QB break us. Get us out of here, Cap. Sack. What did he? What did he say? So this, this right here is our den. And, uh, you know, this den is right next to my dogs. My dogs help me relax. So this is where I do come to relax. And uh, here in the den, obviously, um, you know, uh, there's uh, there's a lot of meaning in the stuff that's on my mantle. Uh, this painting here was painted uh, for me specifically after we got back from Iraq with Lima Company. And um, in a minute when we dim the lights, you'll be able to see. But I lost 22 Marines and, and one sailor there. And this painting actually is a reflection of all those guys that we lost and then you can see this shadow of a ghost with his hand on my shoulder telling me it's all right and so um this 
in this monument uh, we designed and built over there at the at Lima Company. Um, and if you look, it's actually the Twin Towers. And um, all the Marines that we lost, their names are on there as well. <laughs>